Blackstone Launchpad is uh, open to all students, faculty, and alumni, and it's basically our free resource on campus um, for any entrepreneurial things um, that you guys are working on as students, and we can help you out um, in all disciplines and all majors. And so this is a larger um, network. Um, we're at about 75 different schools now. Um, the Launchpad has been here for about seven years, and so we're kind of one of the early adopters. Um, so yeah, these are some of the schools that we uh, also have launch pads at. So basically at the core of what we do is we help problem solvers. And so this is, you know, any engineering, business, uh, a school problem, we help you, um, you know, find that solution through the entrepreneurial um, approach. So kind of breaking down um, some of the things that we do at the launch pad, um, the main thing and what I do as well is the consulting. So you can schedule um, a free appointment with us, um, talk about your business, business model, um, all those great things. Networking, so we've pretty much seen um, every type of industry come through the launch pad, um, and so we can you know, connect you with the person that you need to talk to. Uh, independent study, this is not as popular, but um, we can actually take an entrepreneurial um, program and actually you can get credit for it, which is pretty cool. Design, we have three graphic designers on our team that can help you with branding, um, you know, logos, website, all that cool stuff. Uh, and funding as well. We have some competitions um, and a micro grant program, which um, is a great way to get some money. So, um, another thing we do is seminars and guest speakers. So just like tonight, uh, we have this event, and you know, definitely keep on the lookout for other um, events that we have over uh, the course of the semester. Uh, and then another thing we do is competitions as well. So I will talk about a competition. Well, quickly I'll mention the Tech Entrepreneurship Challenge that's going to be happening next Saturday. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of this um, event tonight. Uh, but the 75K Venture Competition is going to be happening this spring. So this is where some of our more accelerated ventures um, compete for around $75,000 um, in startup funding. And so definitely keep this on your radar. This is a great opportunity um, to see what some of your peers are doing um, in the entrepreneurial space um, this spring. And so yeah, come and find us. Uh, we're in the sub on the main floor. Schedule a meeting with us, um, and we'd love to talk about entrepreneurship and you know, if you have an idea for a business. Thank you. So, for our first presentation, please welcome North Reza. Hello, my name is North Reza. I'm the founder of AZ Tech. 
So I'm gonna go over a bit of background about how we started and what happened and where we are now after four years. So four years ago, we had an idea, and the idea was to put avalanche transceiver on a small drone, kind of like the one you see there, to do search and rescue for uh, in case of avalanche, right? So we took that idea and we went to Gatling County Search and Rescue, and we were like, okay, this is what we have. What do you think? They're like, you know what, that's a really good idea. Yeah, we could use that. And we were like, okay, so what do you, what do you guys do? What kind of search and rescue that you do? And they were like, we do these sites, we have different teams, and by talking to them, first thing we learned was they have a bigger problem. What was the bigger problem? If they have a serious call, instead of, uh, the best way basically they solve if they have a serious call is calling helicopters. So if they have to do real search and rescue, they call a helicopter. That's the best solution they have to find somebody that lost. So we talked to them and we were like, okay, why do you call a helicopter? Because they have drones, they have like those small DJI drones. And they were like, because the drone doesn't get the job done. It can only fly for 20 minutes. It needs perfect weather condition. It's a small, it just not fit the purpose for search and rescue. We are like, okay, so just forget about the transceiver. What kind of drone you want? So they said we want one hour flight time, minimum, if we want to fly a drone. We want to have really good weather resistivity, because we are in Montana. And the other one was payload capacity. They wanted something that can carry better cameras, not like the one that they use in you know, consumer products. So we kind of went away from the initial idea that we had, and we took all of the feedback that we got, and we started designing different drones. And it ended up being what you see, that's the design that we had for uh, for our prototype. So it ended up being a lot bigger drone, but it had everything they asked for. So after that, we started with manufacturing them, with just making the prototype. And we started building that in the garage, and we had to learn a lot, but it was good because we had time to learn. We were, we were, all, we were all the students in the team. And uh, yeah, you see Yanni there, and uh, Yanni is sitting here. So it was a team effort. We built the drone that we had, and we did some initial testing, and a um, couple of years down the line, after four years, this is a design that we have now, that's called White Hawk, that's a production design that we have, and the first one of these is going to be out in two months, the first manufacturer product is going to be out beginning of, uh, mid this summer. So, that was a brief the story of what happened over the last four years. So, after four years, we have reached all of the goals that we had. We have the weather resistivity that we needed. We have the payload that we needed. With this drone, you can actually carry a drone. You can carry cameras and sensors that are made for airplanes, for helicopters. It's kind of hard to see from these pictures. But that drone has nine feet of wingspan, so it's not a it's not a conventional a small drone. <laughs> so yeah, because then like every time I talk to somebody, I tell them drone, they're like, oh, okay, so you make those like a small drone. Like this is aviation grade drone. It has it's a lot different than the conventional drones that you see. So we ended up having better payload than they asked for. We ended up having over two hours of flight time instead of one hour. And it end up being, they, they end up being really happy about what we have now. So throughout the way, we learned few really good lessons. First of all, your idea is not what energy. Talk to your potential user, your potential customer, get their feedback. You don't, you don't need to just like sit in your garage, work on your, they're going to help you build that. What we have right now is purely based on talking to different people, getting feedback. That's how we have the design. 
and it made it so much easier for us and at the end of the day we know that they want the product because they are the one that gave us all of the requirements that they need to we need to have on the drone so that was one of the bigger big lessons actually this uh, last summer we did we went through uh, innovation for with national science foundation and that was a huge experience that was a good experience too because the whole the training that we had through national science foundation was get out there do more research talk to more people so you're not doing just something by yourself you want the feedback feedback is really important and uh, other lesson that we had is you need to have you need to have good mentor and you have good team and that's the good thing about being a student right now is you have access to a lot more resources just by being a student. Like you have access to that kind of that. And I mean, they, you take care of them after they graduate too. But th there are other resources that you might not, or there are other grants that you might not have access to after you graduate. So the point is, starting a company sucks, okay? <laughs> it's not fun. But you have more resources now to do that. And the other thing is, I would say the expectations are a lot lower. Because you are here to get your degree, right? At the end of the day, if your company doesn't work, you still have your degree. You're going to be you're gonna be happy, right? And the other thing is, uh, everybody in this room is young. You have time to learn. And that's the other thing. That's, that's the other big lesson is, you're going to have to, it doesn't matter what your field is, you're going to have to be open to learning. So I'm studying mechanical engineering, but I had to learn tons of uh, finance, marketing, programming, all of the other stuff. But good thing is you have resources. If you're willing to learn, you, have, you can learn all of those skills that you need. Uh, I already mentioned mentors. And these are some of the uh, these are some of the advisors and partners that we have. We work with National Science Foundation, Blackstone Launchpad, and uh, ASCM International, and Promotion Lab at the University of Washington. Jake Jasko is a business, which I'm assuming most of you guys study there, and then ADS State Montana. And we have a lot of other resources. And it's all about when is the, when the time is right. You have the resources, and you can use those things. Last lesson, and this is really important. You need a team. You can't do everything by yourself. You can. It's going to take 20 years. And <laughs> after 20 years, nobody's going to care about that drone or whatever you make, right? You need a team, and you need a good team. You need a team that they know what they're doing, and they can help you to get there and have a successful company. And one thing I would say, if you have an idea, you want to start something, and you're like, okay, maybe I need help, maybe I need a team. You can find people that's gonna help you and they might have experience in the past and you're like, okay, I want somebody to do my accounting that has like 10 years of experience. That's fine, that's good to have. But at the beginning, you don't really need that. The point is, you guys are all there to learn something. And as long as everyone's willing to learn, everyone can grow with the company, right? So you can help each other to get uh, where you want to be. And that's, re that's really important to know that you need a team. You can't do everything by yourself. And just don't be scared. Just go talk to people. Just go tell them, hey, you know, like, I'm thinking about this. I want to do this. What do you think? Oh, I know this person that you can talk to. And uh, they might be able to help you. So worst case, they're going to connect you with somebody else. Or they're going to say, I don't know anything about it. Fine. Feedback. Feedback is good. Try to get as much feedback. And don't be scared of, like, I have this idea. I'm worried somebody might steal it from. That's not going to happen. Because, like I said, it's a lot of work and sucks. I was, nobody wants to do that. Okay? So, yeah, don't be scared to ask questions and share your idea and get feedback. More feedback. So, 
um, that's kind of where we are right now after four years. So thank you. And if you have, if you want to know the rest of my team, they're sitting here. And we have a bunch of business cards and pamphlets there too if you want to learn more. We're also always hire, looking to hire people. So if you're looking for an internship this summer, so just reach out. Thank you. and launch it into a, a startup. An hour late. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do Okay, great. Right. Does this yeah. work for now? Go ahead. Okay. This is awesome. Can you test the oh. code? Yeah. Okay. Um, I will. But I can scroll through. Okay, so the topic for today will be entrepreneurial ventures um, from my lab here at MSU, and they kind of have one thing in common that we are trying to battle now with degeneration. So, <laughs> um, why are we interested in neurodegeneration? Um, Alzheimer's disease is one of the most common form of neurodegeneration, also the most well-known uh, disease of the brain. Um, some of you may have had relatives already uh, which are sh have been showing symptoms or even have died from it. So uh, uh, it is kind of projected that within the next, or within every five years, um, the number of people showing uh, symptoms of Alzheimer's disease is going to double uh, after the age of 65. And uh, we are kind of uh, looking into uh, 2050, for example, uh, into uh, the number of 14 million people in the US uh, having Alzheimer's and this kind of creates a huge financial burden uh, which has been in 2020 for example alone besides for for example the problems we were having with COVID uh, 655 billion uh, alone generated from this disease. Now, okay. <laughs> um, so what we would like to do is, for example, to uh, delay the progression uh, of the disease uh, to kind of lower those type of costs. However, if you are, or yeah, if pharmaceutical uh, companies are trying to develop drugs uh, against Alzheimer's disease, uh, they are often um, need to go uh, through a preclinical trial, a clinical trial, which comes in three phases uh, before they can hit uh, the FDA approval. And this process right now takes over 13 years. So if somebody, can, if you imagine, right, starts showing symptoms around 50 or 65 of Alzheimer's disease, those drugs or developments we are trying to optimize right now or get on the market is not for them, it's almost for the next generation. Now. Um, so, and another problem with this is that 99% of those drugs are actually failing. Um, and one reason is for this, um, because when you uh, go into the preclinical trial and try to get a lot of knowledge uh, about, for example, a new drug candidate, um, we are not testing those drugs in an environment uh, which the brain in uh, humans is kind of uh, generating or situated. Um, so uh, when you uh, kind of look at the slide over here, the, in the preclinical area, the, the test environment is, for example, just a petri dish um, with some fluid and the cells are not growing in the same way in those um, tissue shapes and uh, architecture with layers and uh, cortical folds, uh, which you can see here um, on the right side, uh, where we kind of depicted uh, something from the cerebral cortex. Um, those two pictures are microscopic pictures, which are even highlighting more uh, what I was just talking about, right? So you, a cell layer, for example, is kind of this dense accumulation of, uh, on the right side uh, with those cells in the brain and then like having dendrites growing in one direction and axons in the other, while in the petri dish we do not get um, this uh, kind of assembly. Um, 
we do think and we do know that uh, mechanical forces are kind of involved in the process of shaping, for example, the cerebral cortex uh, in this particular way. And uh, again, uh, growing cells in the petri dish is not kind of exposing them to the appropriate uh, physiological um, mechanical forces as they were seeing this in the brain tissue. So this is where in principle my lab kind of really focuses uh, on uh, engineering the environment in the petri dish to yes, uh, increase uh, knowledge uh, about the efficacy of the drug um, early on so that we can uh, down the road hopefully speed up the clinical trials uh, and get more information earlier on how the drugs would effectively really work and, um, and then lower down the cost as well. Yeah, so uh, the big question is then, okay, well, when you now think about this petri dish and you just try to imagine this plastic photos of one world in biology, you might be very familiar um, with those round um, plastic containers. Then uh, the big question is, well, the, the cells which we are kind of trying to culture in those petri dishes, they're very, very small. Um, they're in the micrometer range. If you want to imagine what a micrometer means, is uh, when you take the diameter of a hair, we are talking about this, that this is going to be 100 micrometer, and uh, your brain cell is a tenth of it. So it's very small. So which means um, just kind of doing some taping, etc., wouldn't really help or do something um, to the environment of the, of, in a mechanical sense, to those brain cells. So you have to really scale this down um, and use technology we are actually normally using to build transistors. So like things which are going in integrated circuits and computers. Um, so there are three ways uh, you can then use uh, technology. You can, for example, mechanically or chemically establish uh, biomolecular gradients to guide the orientation of uh, neurite growth. Uh, neurites, this is what we in general call uh, to be the, those dendrites and axons uh, together. And um, you can also introduce, for example, barriers, uh, microchannels um, to help the cells growing in a particular direction. Or, and this is kind of a newer technology, you can try to work with uh, nanoparticles, uh, which are really of the size of viruses. Uh, they can either enter the cell or they can be attached to the cell membrane. And then you can use, when those nanoparticles are magnetic, uh, use magnetic fields to kind of guide the direction of those um, neurites, axon or dendrites in a particular um, yeah, direction. So, um, okay. This was the research site, so now let's have a look uh, where we are trying to uh, use two of those uh, technologies um, to spin this out into companies. Um, the first one is actually uh, in relation to uh, using those microchannels, and uh, there we had the idea uh, to kind of uh, offer something to the market which improves um, cell growth and can kind of study the progression of disease. and build something around um, uh, testing trucks and then uh, seeing uh, how certain markers are coming up uh, within uh, those devices. So this uh, um, venture idea right now is called Neurofluidic Diagnostics. It has um, uh, the, yeah, the general direction of using nanotechnology based fingerprinting to refine preclinical track discovery for brain diseases. So why am I talking about nano now? Uh, well, what we are trying to get out, uh, or we are kind of using signals which the cells are secreting, and they are then again in the nanometer scale. Um, and this is kind of uh, in relation to the nanotechnology of what we are using then for the fingerprinting approach. Um, okay, so this is how it looks like. Uh, we have imagined uh, that like, um, Track scientists are uh, yeah, developing uh, certain compounds, which then they are going to ship over to, over to us, and then we can uh, actually try to uh, incorporate them in our micro channels and systematically see how uh, signals of neural degeneration are going to uh, progress. And then from there, we can extract uh, certain features um, and develop this fingerprinting approach. Um, what would be the big advantage here is that we are really improving uh, those track studies and uh, are kind of uh, giving more information out back to the scientists as they can uh, do it with the standard biological cultures right now or cell assays. Um, these are two 
graduate students, which you see up there, um, which are involved um, in the development of the technology, and which have been going through training, uh, through the launch pad and the 46 lab, uh, to spin this uh, uh, technology out into the market. And then, uh, this is kind of the uh, example here where we're using this nanotechnology, really with the nanoparticles, to uh, spin this out into uh, nanomagnetic solutions. And this is actually a company which is already incorporated. Um, we are using uh, those nanoparticles uh, for force modulation uh, to revolutionize preclinical drug discovery for pain diseases. And we even have a web page, which we are very proud. And yeah, um, the idea here is <laughs> yeah, to kind of um, superimpose a mechanical force field around those petri dishes. Um, and for to generate this force field, we have yeah built a ring um, which um, kind of superimposes a relatively complex um, permanent magnetic field, and this permanent magnetic field gets translated into the nanoparticles, and then the nanoparticles are actually doing the force interrogation depending on uh, where they are sitting and to which parts of the cells they have been bound. Um, here you see kind of uh, yeah our unique selling points in relation to uh, the device. And um, overall, what we all can do with it, and this is really where this technology is tremendously enabling. Um, we cannot just guide those neurites in a particular direction now. We have also seen in research um, how uh, uh, those mechanical forces are involved in uh, the um, crawling or the um, organization of um, proteins inside the cells, and then uh, uh, this is linked to molecular motors. So again, for the biologists, you may notice um, your neurites, uh, they have kind of a skeleton, and along the skeleton, there's a little motor which kind of like walks along and transports the proteins, for example, uh, from the cell body away to the uh, uh, tips where the synapses are uh, transmitting information. Um, yeah, so those mecha mechanical forces can be designed in a way that you interfere with those. Uh, you can also use it to uh, genetically modify those cells, or you can use it to study uh, just general cell communication, uh, so how those uh, neurons are connecting and then transporting uh, information from one cell to the other. So there are many different applications, and this is where we think like this to take off. Okay, so yeah, so this was the research slide and kind of linking uh, research, ongoing research with technology development and bringing it out uh, into the market. And the big question is now, well, how can you get involved, right? Um, this might really like sound really like over your head right now, but um, there, there is actually a lot of space for undergraduates um, to uh, get started or going uh, and being involved in those uh, startup ideas. Yeah, so the first thing I really recommend is that you start with rigorous training in uh, the technology area. Um, this is an example just for my particular research, but uh, you may even be able to connect to another professor um, more on bone uh, research or more in the computer science area, and they all kind of have those um, those specific areas where they recommend you should start uh, your undergraduate degree. So for example, for us, this would be in engineering, really taking those courses with microfabrication, uh, electronics, signal processing, and of course, electromagnetics. Um, and then also like mathematics, where you uh, learn how to uh, process signals and data uh, down the road. And of course, you also need uh, a few of those courses, or you need to collaborate with somebody who knows a lot about the cell biology of neurons. Um, so to get there, to get there in the sweet little spot in the middle, um, this is what MSU is going to uh, offer within the College of Engineering. So again, if you are from a program in Letter and Sciences, or from, um, um, yeah, environmental sciences or, or other, yeah, other areas, it, this might look a little different. But uh, in the College of Engineering, for example, uh, you would start with all your basic engineering courses, um, and then you can take, for example, courses which are called bioelectronics or biomems um, to kind of get really more into uh, those uh, more specialized areas, um, specifically for our research. 
Uh, we also highly recommend, and I think I have mentioned this, and this is also where some of you have been going to the undergraduate research symposium, starting with programs like the FIRE or the USB and INPRI, and really getting in contact uh, with uh, faculties here on campus who are doing research, and then uh, uh, using the mechanism of 290R or 490R, so these are course, courses, right, uh, research courses, where you uh, can get, even get credit uh, for your work in the lab. And then uh, not only learning the technology, but uh, also kind of really trying to uh, move forward the development of a particular prototype. Um, and then from there, uh, you can then, yeah, talk to the professor and of course, like, hopefully get the okay, but then really go with this to the launch bed and then get the whole business side um, and then shooting off your, your venture ideas. Um, yeah, so, so this is kind of giving you a short overview of what are those uh, possibilities uh, for you here on campus. And um, yeah, and other than this, um, and this has been already super mentioned before, uh, you have a tremendous amount of network here available uh, through the business school, through the launch pad, uh, through the tech transfer, uh, which you would then also will be working with if you try to uh, outsource technology. And uh, in particular, and I can just we say it like use the launch pad for graphic design, web pages, pitch decks, and learning all the business language. This was really, yeah, super helpful. And uh, we'll move your project forward. Yeah, and I think there, yeah, this is just an acknowledgement slide. We have to bring this up because a lot of the, all the research is funded by external um, agencies. And then uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, you can scan this code. Uh, we are right now uh, organizing some lab tours for our lab because we are actually trying to get more undergraduates into the lab, so feel free to sign up if you want. Mm -hmm. Our last presentation before the panel is from Marcus. Uh, you like Can we actually decide? Yeah. Hello, welcome, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Marcus, I'm with a company called Morel. Um, if you haven't heard of Morel, we don't cure um, Alzheimer's or even attempt to, unfortunately. We, uh, we make apps for restaurants. Uh, this is one of our, uh, one. we actually have a platform, so any restaurant can build their own app. Um, and I'm going to tell you how we kind of came to this idea and a little bit about how we did it. Um, and it actually starts out um, in 2015, I started school for computer science. Not actually here, it's in Billings, and then I transferred, so that was um, a bummer. Um, and, but anyway, I, I learned a lot of lessons along the way. Um, and so kind of the theme of this uh, that I'm going to tell you is three lessons that I've learned that I really didn't expect, or honestly, uh, lessons that I kind of fought kicking and screaming to learn. I, lessons I didn't want to learn, but are really important. And so um, I wanted to think about things that maybe you've heard that um, I remember being young and blowing them off. Um, so these are the lessons. So first, uh, I actually got a job at City Group Coffee. Um, you know, they say start these things off establishing credibility. This is my credibility here. Um, I think it's probably the best picture I've ever taken. Um, you can actually see there's a little faint mustache thing underneath my nose. But, um, anyway, that is uh, how it started. I was a barista. Uh, I made coffee for City Brew uh, for a couple of years, actually. Um, and then I, one summer, really wanted to apply the stuff I was learning in computer science. I wanted to build an app. I had never done it before, but it was like one summer in between my sophomore and uh, junior year. I'm like, I'm going to learn this. Um, I found the source code for it still available online if you want to laugh at it. Um, I tried to like run this app. It doesn't run anymore. Um, it, was, it was pretty bad, uh, but I loved it. <laughs> it was the first app I'd ever made, and so I showed it to everyone. I showed it to you know, my friends and my coworkers. Um, it was actually an app to help with the paperwork at the time we were doing it, like a calculator and pen and paper, and it was super inefficient, so it was like a really simple thing that made my job easier. Um, and I showed it to a ton of people, and one of those people um, was my assistant manager at City Brew, who happened to work for a software company called Foundin. Um, so he threw the bike by and basically he's like, hey, you clearly maybe know something. So I got to intern at Foundin. And then at the same time, literally the same month, I got an offer um, from some people at Citigroup Corporate that I had talked to. 
to help them promote City Brew University, which was their new training program, and kind of build that out. Um, and what's cool about that is, like, I, um, I, I basically had no skills. I didn't actually take the app that I built that went nowhere, but it was just through kind of talking to people. Um, I got to work my way into some cool opportunities um, down the road. So um, what ended up happening was I, um, through the City Brew internship, they ended up needing more tech help. Um, they needed more things. So I ended up becoming the director of technology, uh, which was pretty cool. While I was a student, I ended up doing part-time school for like four years while I was working full-time in charge of the technology at City Brew. Um, so that top picture there, uh, we promoted uh, or we implemented a new point of sale into all like 28 stores, which was awesome um, to drive around and get to, well first pick out the point of sale, but then get to uh, try to implement it. And then we also built a whole new loyalty program, which is that City Brew Perks. Um, that was all, we got to hand code it. And then eventually around 2020, they wanted to build a mobile app, kind of like what Starbucks has, like an order and do loyalty. And, oh, I didn't even get to that. Anyway. Uh, before we get to the app, sorry, I, I had my slides up earlier. Um, this is that first lesson: um, is it's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, I actually cross out the not because I think it's probably what you know and who you know. You need both. But I, I used to hear that phrase: it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I've, I've heard that a million times. I thought it was stupid. Like I'm like, that's only what people say if they don't actually like know how to do things. But like I was like, whatever. I, I have a big ego and thought I was really smart. So networking was for only people who like didn't have a cool idea. I was totally wrong about that. If you look at the success I've had up to this point and later on, basically it was because I showed and I talked to people, people that I didn't expect to really be my like world into tech, like my assistant manager at City Brew, or just some random person at a, city, like a company called City Brew Coffee. Um, like I didn't expect that to really be the thing that, that drove me forward. Um, so I, I kind of learned like networking is not necessarily just going to these networking events and um, meeting people, although that's cool too. Um, but trying to just talk to the people around you about what you're interested in, um, you know, you never know who's going to be the person to do that. And then same way too, don't be afraid of a conversation. If somebody asks you, hey, do you want to, you want to, you know, talk about this idea I have? Always talk to them. Like anytime somebody wants to talk to you, especially about a business idea, I, I would just always give them the time. You know, give them an hour just to see what's up because you never know what's going to be the one that like takes off. Um, Another demonstration of this that I just want to show, um, on LinkedIn, um, I've built up 722 connections, um, which uh, most of those people I don't actually really know, but I uh, build up those connections. But then what I thought is crazy is the second connection, so those are people that I know that like, I'm connected to through like friends of a friend, kind of. Uh, LinkedIn says there's 726,000 of those, which is crazy. Because then that's all people that I have, I know someone in common. And if, let's say, they were a venture capital firm and I needed money for my startup, uh, I could say, hey, I noticed you know this person. How do you, how do you know X, Y, Z? And like, there's almost a quarter of a million or three quarters of a million there. Like, it's actually crazy. That network effect, it's wild. Like, it's, it's way more powerful than I thought it was. So anyway, back to the City Reef story. We were doing all this stuff. Actually, we got to meet all these companies. That was one of the cool things, um, speaking of network. Um, and so I, I talked to people at all these different companies, tried to soak up as much information as I could. Um, we ended up, we wanted a mobile app. So we signed a deal with this company called Patronix, uh, which is described as, as the Cadillac of mobile apps, for this kind of thing. Uh, they're a huge company that has made tons of the apps that exist out there today. Um, but here, I want to walk you through the process a little bit about what this looked like for us. Um, well, actually, first, here's some apps that they've made. Um, you can see, maybe they're not the best, uh, I don't think they're very visually appealing. They also all look the same. That's kind of what the city brand almost looked like. Uh, we had actually like signed a deal with them, and we had to back out of it at some point. So um, it was pretty pretty dramatic at the time. But the process was so you basically start in the top left there um, with a like introduction form, and then you schedule a Zoom call, and then eventually, if you decide you like it, you pay them some money. I actually found recently the contract that we signed. It's like ten thousand dollars to do this. Um, not all together, but after like the whole implementation was like $10,000. But anyway, so then eventually, once you sign on the other line, then you have more Zoom calls, you have to like give them like some assets, some pictures, and then they kind of like generate this app that I don't even think looks very good. And then that inevitably leads to more calls, and then eventually more signing, more money. And like if everything goes well, then you get an app on the App Store. Um, you spend a ton of money. And that was also like for a city, like $6,000 a month 
after that. So it's like crazy expensive, not a very good product, took forever. Um, and so um, we ended up saying we're going to build our own app. That's where I met Bruce, who is our uh, co-founder in Morel. Um, so Bruce and I kind of teamed up to build City Root, a mobile app. Uh, and he said, there it is. I think it looks a lot better, <laughs> personally. Uh, but that is the City Root app. Uh, you can use it today in order. There's three of them here in town. Uh, but that's kind of what we, we had done. And through that whole process, one, we learned a ton, but also we, we just um, learned there was, the market was kind of crappy. There wasn't a lot of good stuff. So basically, we said, let's just take what we learned at City Brew and like, try to do a new thing. Um, so that's what we did. Uh, we started out with this prototype um, here, which was uh, early on. Um, it was the start. And then we entered the uh, big idea uh, pitch competition, which I thought I'd a little bit, but I guess not. Uh, we entered the big idea pitch competition uh, after we talked to the Blackstone Launchpad. Um, oh, there it is. So that's what we did uh, in the fall with that prototype and, and this idea of we're going to make a better system where it doesn't cost you know, a ton of money, it doesn't take forever to do, and we don't need like 18 Zoom calls to make you an app. And there we are. There's Bruce. This is a funny picture, I think, because uh, my head is kind of behind Bruce there. So the camera person <laughs> did a great job there. Uh, also, everyone's masked because it was still, still in that era. Um, but that's us in the big idea competition. We didn't do very well. Uh, <laughs> we didn't win any prizes. Uh, luckily, everyone that made it to this like, semi-final thing uh, got 500 bucks. So we were, we were like happy about that. But um, you know, we didn't get accolades or whatever. Um, but we tried not to let that stop us. Um, we ended up keep developing. We built uh, kind of onto our prototype until it was like this version. Um, we can actually, if you see that button on the app, it's green, but now it's blue. So you can like edit it in real time. That was kind of part of our pitch is that you could do this in real time. And that's actually still part of our pitch. It's part of the uh, core part of our product. You can kind of design the app and see it as you use it. Um, but anyway, we ended up quite a few months later. So this is uh, the idea competition was in like October. This is like May, May, April, of the next, maybe April of the next year. And uh, we ended up entering this John Roboto startup competition. It's actually a kind of crazy story because before um, we got to go to San Francisco um, for a bunch of um, just networking events and kind of informational, it was hosted through the launchpad itself, um, kind of like a big convention of all the launchpads. Um, and then that same week, we ended up flying direct from San Francisco to Missoula to compete in this competition. And to make a long story short, we ended up winning that. And so we got like $15,000 there, which was, that was a good day. <laughs> uh, it felt great. And then about two weeks later was the 50K competition, which is now the 75K competition. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, and to be honest, we got, we got lucky twice because um, we won that one too. And so it very quickly went from like this little idea of, hey, we have this prototype to like, we have some cash. Um, by the way, we also got to network, speaking of networking, that guy in both these pictures here, um, his name's Les, he uh, is a venture capital guy here in town. Um, just, again, more networking. Like, I would have never expected that the way I'd meet my first person at a venture capital firm was through this little thing on the school campus that I'd heard about, um, which kind of leads me to the second thing, which is use the launch pad. I know <laughs> both people have been up here saying there's tons of resources. I remember being in a seat like this and hearing about how, how there's so many resources, you should take advantage of them. Thinking like, yeah, but like, really though? No? I was super skeptical. That was stupid. Uh, there's like, and I've now since graduated, and those resources dry up like as soon as you graduate. Not all of them, but a lot of them, most of them. And so, um, use the dang launch pad. If you have an idea, just go talk to them. Uh, I've met like, I mean, that LinkedIn number of 700, whatever. I started like 200, but just met so many people through the launch pad. I got to go to San Francisco, um, and then we ended up, all told, raising like $41,000 in the course of six months. Now, I'm not saying, uh, Trevor told me to add a disclaimer, you're not gonna get that necessarily, <laughs> but like, that's what we did. We got really lucky a bunch of times in a row. Um, that's kind of the opportunity that's available to build our company. So like, literally, Bruce is now a full-time employee of our company, uh, taking from this, this pot a little bit, um, which is, I, I, I think, crazy. I would've never expected it. That's kind of something that I would never expect to launch pad, had that ability to, you know, if you have a good idea, make it a real company. But they did, so, um, yeah, that's, that's something I expect. 
So a little bit about just what's happened afterwards since uh, um, those competitions kind of turned it into a real company. Um, we have worked with a couple different clients. This is a company in Salt Lake called So Delicious that we literally, it's funny timing, just yesterday built their app, their first version, so we're stoked to get that out there. Um, it's, we're hoping like 26,000 people will use it. It's gonna like be awesome. Um, there's Bruce and I at the airport, which is fun. Um, but I think the third, the, the, the last kind of point that I learned, um, I've told you my story, you've heard stories from other people today. This is actually something Les taught us that I think is crazy. The story, your story is the most valuable resource you have. I would not have expected that. I thought your idea or your, your ability, you know, your, your able, ability to code or whatever. What I've found is if you don't have a good story and you can't tell that story well in like kind of an engaging way, you're not gonna be able to get any kind of VC funding, you're not gonna be able to get customers. You're basically not gonna be able to build a company if you can't tell the story, the story of why it exists, how it came to be, where it's headed. You know, people love to attach to those stories. So if you're thinking about an idea, start to think about what that story could look like. And it doesn't, it, it shouldn't look like my story. It should be your own story. You know, tell what's, what's kind of, how, what's led you to the idea and as it continues to develop, you know, how it creates, how it's created. So anyway, that's, uh, that's the story. Thank you. challenge we've faced and we're still facing that we're, we're starting to overcome is it's being taken seriously a little bit especially we, we're trying to sell to other businesses we're trying to tell a business that you should trust us these two kids from Montana with your business and you know your customers are gonna 
see what we put out there. And so that's a lot of trust for a business to place in us. Um, and so uh, I think kind of the way we're working around it is one, just making sure the product looks real. You know, they, they don't, a lot of those companies don't care that we're students, they, or that we're students, that you know, they, they just want to see a company and they're gonna about judge it against every other company that they could go with. Um, and so I think just working hard to make it look presentable, uh, professional. Uh, but I think also, you know, just, um, I lost my train of thought. Anyway, make it look professional. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is a really good question. Um, and I think challenging for us in particular, because this is like really research connected, is at some point, uh, those companies, they need to be independent of the university. And I think this is something we're, we're still struggling with and where we need to yeah, focus on and push things forward. Yeah. So for those ones who really down the road are one of your with technology, which is coming out from a particular lab here, you will need to think about like, okay, when and how do you become independent of uh, technology, which is in the research space. I know that there are so many challenges we have, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I would say there is. It's so we work with we work on the software and hardware side of things, and uh, it makes it's like it's twice harder, I would say. And uh, so some of the challenges that we had was on the tech side, because I don't know how to do it. So, and that's why. One of the things I mentioned was having the blue team and just realizing when you get the stuff that I'm a stuff. I need I need to talk to somebody and to find somebody that can, you know, help me take this forward. So on the tech side we had challenges, on the business side we had challenges because I don't I don't have business background. Again, finding people that can help me. And at the end of the day it's there's going to be tons of challenges. And there's going to be the the best part about like this whole system is you're gonna have to be making thousands of decisions. Some of them are gonna be right, some of them are gonna be wrong. You just have to make sure you make more right <laughs> And then if you make some bad dishes decisions then you just hope that it's gonna be fine. <laughs> Um, in your opinion, what is the best place to start if you have a good idea for a product? Talk to the launch net. <laughs> Not kidding. That's that's a great place to start. This is how we started. Uh, we were approached uh, by people at conferences like, hey, can you ship us the device? And I was like, Ooh, uh, I have no idea. And then I went with the poster, actually, with the print of the poster and said, like, hey, how can we put this into a product? <laughs> so tell us, yeah, what's the, what's the venture trajectory here? What, what's the, what are the different steps? Where do we start? And uh, we actually went back and um, had yeah, we, we kind of went back to a group of students who were uh, a team of capstone students through the electrical and computer engineering department and uh, kind of uh, re-engineered um, the system so that it looked like a product and then we went from there. Yeah. Stop the Trevor. You guys know Trevor? I did not pay them to say that. <laughs> he, he did not. did not. I may have bought them some food. But I did not pay them. <laughs> I guess Talk to them. maybe one thing too is like try to figure out what the minimum viable product is. Like, it, like when we started out, okay, let's have this awesome system where anyone can build an app and and you know this ambitious kind of thing. So we had to pare it down to like what is the core like base functionality, and uh, that's really hard to do, especially if you're kind of like a type that likes to build stuff because you just want to build the whole thing. Um, but. Uh, you gotta, you gotta make sure you get that minimum version and try to validate it as much as you can and get that feedback. I think it's something that Morteza said in this talk that was really good. It was like, you, you're constantly getting feedback from people that might purchase or you know, be clients of yours. So, um, yeah, that kind of feedback cycle is really good. So start with the smallest thing. Um, and then last question, uh, maybe give us like a one sentence tagline, like what gave you the courage to start your business? I think for me it was just like, like I said in the talk, that I knew that the market really needed a solution and 
I didn't really have a lot of courage that I could necessarily be the one to deliver it, but who else was doing it? You know, might as well try. So, yeah. Can I go over one sentence? So this is the, yeah, I can't do two hours. <laughs> but uh, I would say, you know, when you start your college, you're like, okay, this is like really cool. I'm out of like high school, I made it, I'm in college, perfect. You're like, oh, okay, I have engineering degree, this is, but you know, one thing like, down the line you realize it, nobody cares. You're like, sure, like from, from high school to MSU, big, like, big jump. But when you make it to MSU, you're common again, normal, just like everybody else. Right? And it's gonna be the same after you graduate. You might think that, okay, I have this good degree from this university, but at the end of the day, you're gonna be calm. And I was like, how can I push that? How can I push the limit and do something more? So I'm, I can, yeah, you can do more. Trust me, you can. Just trust yourself and do it. More than one sentence. It's a long sentence. <laughs> Okay, we'll try and work on. Um, we really wanted to bring uh, technology into the market so that more people can use it, not just researchers. Thank you.